now five o'clock, December 5th, 2017. <coughs> and I call to order the meeting of the City Council of the City of Victorville. And the City Council seating is the Library Board of Thank Trustees, you. Southern California Logistics Rail Authority, Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, successor agency to the Victorville Redevelopment Agency, the Victorville Joint Powers <coughs> Financing Authority, the Victorville Water District, and the city is housing assets successor. May we have roll call, please? <coughs> Councilmember Gomez? Good evening. Councilmember Kennedy? Here. Councilmember Negretti is absent. Mayor Pro Tem Cox? Here. Mayor Garcia? Here. Mr. Negretti going to be here? I have not heard that he will not be here. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the time and place for the general public to address the city council on any item listed or not listed on the agenda per government code section 54954.3. State law prohibits the council from addressing any issue not previously included on the agenda. The council may receive testimony and set the matter to a subsequent uh, meeting. Um, I don't have any cards. Uh, I don't see anyone that wants to address the uh, council. Um, therefore, may we have declaration of closed session items by our city attorney, please. Thank you, Mayor Garcia. We have 10 items listed this evening. However, several of those items are related. Item A for the city council is anticipated litigation pursuant to government code 54956.9D2 and the facts and circumstances related to that are set forth on the agenda pursuant to government code 54956.9E3. Items B and C are existing litigation on behalf of the City Council and they are related to items F, G, H, and I on behalf of the Airport Authority. That is existing litigation pursuant to government code 54956.9D1 and the case names and case numbers are all set forth on the, on the agenda. Item D is related to item J, item D for the City Council, item J for the Airport Authority. Also existing litigation pursuant to Government Code 54956.9D1. And again, the case number and case names are set forth on the agenda. And lastly, item E is public employment, uh, public, sorry, public employee appointment pursuant to Government Code 54957 and the position is Interim City Manager. To the extent there's reportable action, we will report them either at the conclusion of the closed session or at the commencement of the six o'clock regular session. Thank you. We will now recess to our closed session and our regular session convenes at 6 p.m. Six o'clock, December 5th, 2017. Uh, there is a black Hyundai license number 8ATX037, and the trunk is open. I don't know if it's black. I think it might be broken. I don't know. I can't tell the Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. You have a winner. Uh, it is 6 o'clock, uh, December 5th, 2017. And I call to order the meeting of the City Council of the City of Victorville. And the City Council seating is the Library Board of Trustees, Southern California Logistics Rail Authority, Southern California Logistics Airport uh, Authority, a uh, successor agency to the Victorville Redevelopment Agency, the Victorville Joint Powers Financing Authority, the Victorville Water District, and the City is Housing Assets successor. Uh, may we have roll call, please? Council Member <coughs> Gomez. Good evening. Council Member Kennedy? Here. Council Member Negretti? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Cox? Here. Mayor Garcia? Here. May we have our uh, closed session announcements by our city attorney, please? Thank you, Mayor Garcia. We had 10 items on the agenda this evening, uh, several of which were related. Item A was anticipated lit litigation pursuant to Government Code 54956.9D2. And the facts and circumstances related thereto are set forth pursuant to Government Code 54956.9E3. Items B and C were existing litigation pursuant to Government Code 54956.9D1. And, and they are related. They are related to items 
um, FGH and I on behalf of the airport authority is all the same litigation. The case names and case numbers are set forth on the agenda. Item D is related to item J on behalf of the airport authority and uh, that is also existing litigation pursuant to government code 54956.9D1. And lastly, item E is public employee appointment pursuant to government code 54957. The only reportable action is with respect to item E. The city council by unanimous vote voted to uh, appoint Keith Metzler to serve as interim city manager beginning on January 1, 2018 and directed me to prepare a contract to, to uh, set that forth. Thank you. Uh, the um, invocation in place of, uh, the invocation will be delivered by Debbie Eckerman from High Desert Church. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Police Chief John Schuler. so please stand. Hi, on behalf of High Desert Church, thanks for having us here. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your sovereignty and for the hope and the peace that you give to those who trust in you. And I um, pray for our city leaders and everyone who is here tonight, God, that you would um, give them wisdom um, as these items are discussed and discernment um, for the best decisions to be made. We thank you so much um, for just your provision and all you do for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. This evening we do not have any proclamations. However, we do have an introduction of Lieutenant John Wickham Wake, by Police Chief John Schuler. Uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council, I'd like to take this time to introduce a new member to the Victorville Sheriff's Department. Um, John Wickham has taken the place of Lieutenant Chris Fisher, who was recently promoted. John is, is not new to the city. He's, he's uh, worked here uh, prior, and I'm going to let him uh, <coughs> talk about himself and what he's going to do for us. Good evening. Um, I was very fortunate to get a call from the sheriff reassigning me to the Victorville Station on November 25th of uh, this year, um, taking Lieutenant Fisher's place. I've spent the last 25 years of my 27 year career in the high desert. Um, from 2005 to 2012, I was assigned to the Victorville station. So it was really a blessing to come back. Um, this is like coming back home for me. Um, I love this town. Like I said, I've worked in the high desert my whole career. Um, it was a pleasure to meet you all. And uh, I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. You're welcome. Very happy to have you. Uh, we do not have any appeal hearings, <coughs> and we do not have any public hearings. Therefore, we move on to consent <coughs> calendar. Consent calendar items C1 through C4 can be approved with one motion unless there is an item that needs to be uh, removed for discussion. Move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Mr. Cox. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Now we move on to written communications. And item D1 is appointment of mayor and mayor pro tem. Uh, the uh, recommendation is any action is at the uh, discretion of the city council. So, is there any discussion, motion? I'd like to nominate Mayor Garcia. Second. Motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Mr. Cox to nominate Mayor Garcia as mayor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Before, an, before the, the official vote comes through, I'd like to have comment. 
and that's usually the way it goes, but today it wasn't, so I'm not sure if I'm not able to comment on this, so I would like um, the opportunity to comment. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, in looking back, I understand that it's very difficult to be a mayor, and I understand that there's a lot of requirements like listening skills and being able to also bring the community and bring the partnership of just different council members here. I have witnessed within this last year, our current presiding mayor, um, not to be as fulfilled as I would have seen Mayor Pro Tem Cox. With one absence, I saw Mayor Pro Tem Cox was very, very ready and prepared and was able to mobilize each one of us into all the sections that we had. For instance, right now you just noticed how I was, I was seemingly not able to comment and some of those things are already ingrained where we're supposed to have a vote, a motion, but we're also allowed to comment beforehand. And when some of these things don't occur, it seems like I'm being rude and I'm interjecting, but that's not the case. This is how we do with when we follow parliamentary procedures. So I understand that she has the vote, but I'd like to set on the record that if we would allow Jim Cox to be the mayor, all of our meetings would run much more smoothly than they have in the last year when I came into office. So I'm hoping you don't have to have another HBO session up here, and I'm hoping um, the mayor would be a little bit more accommodating to how the rules are operating. That would really make the facilitation of me being able to speak as a, minor a minority voice, and I would really appreciate that. And also to be able to respect the, the current policies that we have, that five minute session, or the five minutes, and not to interrupt me when it's my time. And I'm willing to also respect whatever her wishes are as the mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Nominate Jim Cox as pro tem. Second. Um, just to clarify for the record, was that a unanimous vote of, of, of approval for Mayor Garcia? No, my vote is was, no. Okay, thank you. Motion by Mr. Kennedy to appoint Mr. Cox as Mayor Pro Tem. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Negretti. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Now we move on to item D2, end of the year update. Uh, recommendation is information item only and uh, is done, Holland, here. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Don Holland. I'm policy advisor to First District Supervisor Robert Levingood, and I'm pleased to bring uh, to you a brief report highlighting the work of Supervisor Levingood has accomplished uh, within the First District and countywide. Supervisor Levingood has embarked on his second term as county supervisor and was appointed chairman of the Board of Supervisors in January of this year. He'll continue serving as chairman through 2018, working with his colleagues to provide leadership and governance to our county. Since 2012, Supervisor Lovingood has consistently focused on public safety and is responsive to the issues affecting our communities. Due to Sacramento's policies with AB 109, Prop 47, and Prop 57, we have seen early release negatively impact our neighborhoods. In June of this year, Supervisor Lovingood championed a $1 million allocation for our law enforcement agencies to use in their direct efforts throughout the county to address challenges of crime. Operation Desert Guardian is an ongoing effort in the first district that has been a huge success. There were 20 anti-crime sweep operations conducted between June and September, resulting in 834 arrests, 150 felony, and 684 misdemeanors. Supervisor Levingood anticipates a relentless effort from law enforcement and the district attorney's office to combat crime through their strategic operations and collaboration with all entities. Our San Bernardino County fire team has also provided exceptional service uh, to the first district this year. There were a number of uh, situations throughout the year that county fire team uh, brought down swiftly and efficiently. San Bernardino County fire works alongside Cal Fire, US Forest Service, law enforcement, fire safe councils and local agencies to provide needed services in and around our communities. 
uh, on economic and uh, workforce development. Uh, Supervisor Lemmingood continues to seek opportunities to bring economic opportunities and jobs to the first district. Our Made in the High Desert uh, two-day manufacturers event is coming to the fairgrounds in February 2018, offering opportunities for students to engage with first district employers to better understand the job opportunities and training needs. The event will also include a job fair to provide opportunities for on-site interviews. We also continue to collaborate with our education and business leaders to work toward aligning uh, job training and employer needs. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, a building at the county fairgrounds burned down a few months ago, uh, forcing the Victor Valley Rescue Mission to make other arrangements for its annual winter shelter program. The mission was looking at leasing uh, and transporting portable buildings at a fairly steep cost. Supervisor Lovingood learned of this and called Marine Corps Colonel uh, Correga at the Marine Corps Logistics Base in Barstow. They worked out a plan uh, for the Marine Corps to lend the uh, county two large heavy-duty winter tents. The tents were erected last month, and today the Board of Supervisors formally approved the agreement with the Marine Corps. Uh, May I continue? Go on. Okay. Uh, we'll wrap up here briefly. Um, uh, following a national CEO search, the Board of Supervisors recently appointed Gary McBride as Chief Executive Officer of San Bernardino County. Uh, Mr. McBride stood, stood out for his proven ability to lead well uh, and his great knowledge of our county. Having a 23-year career with the county and most recently serving as Chief Financial Officer, CEO McBride brings uh, integrity, a strong financial background, and experience to our organization. We look forward to working with him in a continued pursuit of opportunities for our county. On behalf of Supervisor Lemingood, I'd like to thank the council for your uh, continued leadership and thank the community members for attending this meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much for such important and uh, information. We really do appreciate it. Um, now we move on to item D3. For item D1, or this item, I'm sorry, I have a couple of questions for or comments that I would like to be able to give out to him so if I may have the time to speak. So um, I, I was just interested, you, ha you gave a lot of information that's really important. If I can get a copy of that, or you know, that would really, really help me out so I'm engaged with what's going on in the community and how um, Loving Good is being able you know, to come out uh, <coughs> to the city of Victorville. If you can give me a copy of that, or maybe when you do another presentation, give me a briefing of what it is, and that way I, I have that, so I don't have to go look for you. What happened February 2018? Just just for my, my knowledge. That was it. Thank you, we'll, though. We'll, we'll uh, send you a copy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, now we move on to item D3, amendment to SLA ACE 2017-2018 fiscal year budget. Madam Clerk, read the uh, recommendation. The recommend. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, is this the item where it was uh, three, four, and five could be um, voted on together, or is this not the one? You, not that you, I'm aware you of. You can. Uh, it should be separate. The they're separate items. They're dealing with separate subjects, but the latter two require the first one to be approved before you can approve the second and the third. Okay, so we're just approving item D3 then. So uh, Madam Clerk, read the uh, recommendation, please. The recommendation is that the Board of Directors approve an amendment to SCLAA's fiscal year 2017-2018 <coughs> budget, decreasing revenues and increasing e expenditures, and recognize a source of funding for the projected $5.6 million shortfall as the previously approved interfund loan from the taxable housing set aside revenue parity bonds series 2007 fund to the airport operations fund. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I do. Um, for the benefit of the public, I would like staff to be able to address the inner loan fund and then the $10 million line of credit along with the shortfall of revenues and the increases of the expenses that are gonna be modified in, in the budget. Uh, yes, thank you, Council Member and members of the Council. Uh, this item very generally is um, akin to a mid-year uh, budget review. We're doing it perhaps one month early, but it's uh, necessary in this case because we have um, in forthcoming items, expenditures, pr uh, large capital projects that we have to undertake. Um, so 
Um, one of the things that happened in this budgeting cycle is we budgeted um, based upon what was known at the time, based upon what was known in terms of revenues versus expenditures. But certainly after the budget was approved, uh, things uh, did develop such as uh, some issues with some tenancies out at the airport that drove revenues down. Uh, so we're not able to meet revenue projections. Um, also, uh, incidentally, after the budget was approved, uh, there was um, a determination as to the progress of the SEC uh, legal case, um, all of which require either a reduction in revenue projections or an increase in expenditures. So back in September of 2016 is when we first started seeing some operational uh, challenges at the airport in terms of revenues meeting expenditures. Uh, we um, approved or the council approved a $10 million line of credit uh, to be available so that it could be used to satisfy any operating shortfalls um, immediately or shortly thereafter uh, about two and a half million dollars was drawn from that line of credit uh, then secondly a line of credit draw was uh, completed in uh, to close out the 1617 fiscal year to the order of 5.2 million. This item requires 5.6 million to be drawn from uh, an estimated 6.3 available, and that would allow us to fund the amounts necessary to get us through the fiscal year. Uh, staff believes that's what's required to get through the fiscal year, certainly in cases where revenues come in that weren't anticipated that could help reduce that draw. We certainly will only draw. Uh, what's necessary, uh, but that is the the basic effect of um, our basic summary of, of this item in the fiscal impact section of the staff report. You'll see the um, the delta changes to both uh, revenue and expenditures. Um, so with that, unless there's anything more specific, um, I believe staff's recommendation is to go ahead and approve. No, I have no further questions. Thank you for the modification information of the budget. I appreciate that. I have a question, Madam Mayor. Yes, go ahead. This is an interim fund loan to how long is this loan for? And since it's an interim fund loan from one fund to another, how what is the interest being paid and how did you arrive at that interest rate? Uh, bear with me, I have answered those answers to those. I believe they're just here and here they are. Um, so the loan is a five-year term uh, the interest rate defined it looks like this is the resolution uh, is defined as um, payable on da, 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 bear with me uh, payable on total amount borrowed from inception indexed against the Wall Street Journal prime rate at the time it was 3.5 percent so it's against it's measured against the Wall Street Journal prime rate thank you and I have a question if I may to the attorney we reference in the body of the staff report uh, the reason for this, and we reference SEC versus the city. This has been going on, the SEC uh, issue for, what, eight years? Uh, to the attorney, do we have a trial date, and can that be uh, <coughs> revealed to the public? We do have a trial date. That is public information. It is January 23rd. Thank you. All I have. Uh, one of the revenue decreases is transportation process from Southern California Logistics Air March Field. We made a fairly significant effort to negotiate renegotiate uh, try to prevent that can you give us some idea of why that happened uh, I believe we did make a fairly meaningful effort to renegotiate that and um, and try to keep them here in fact those efforts probably lasted over the course of a year um, but as you probably are aware um, the NTC is is the operation that had operated out of SCLA and I recall dating back to perhaps 1998 so they'd been a long-term occupant and their primary mission there had been to serve as movement control company for troop movements in and out of uh, the Fort Irwin for national training purposes. Um, the fundamental, the, probably the most fundamental reason we understand 
driving the decision to locate to march was that there was a larger national objective to utilize existing military facilities um, and because march was available and there was an existing rotation operating out of there for the marine corps we believe that was one of the main drivers as to why they relocated uh, there of course it makes real economic sense to drive troops from march to fort Irwin as opposed to our airport to Fort Irwin. Yeah, we certainly believed that if there was an opportunity for us to try to keep them, it was to really push that issue, and we pushed it pretty hard, um, not only the cost, but the, the time and the uncertainty through the pass. Um, we did make some very significant efforts, um, probably towards the early part and middle part of this year, to actually retool and, and restructure altogether the traditional uh, uh, transactional structure that we had. Because a traditional transactional structure that we had was uh, the NTC would lease facility, ramp, and parking area so that they can not only stage troops, but they can stage aircraft, equipment, and people. Um, so one of the things that we had done, because we had believed from them uh, that their costs were driving down largely because they're sharing an existing federal facility, we did make a move to, to try to change the entire structure of our um, transaction with them to where they were paying on a use basis. And we just couldn't seem to come to terms uh, on that. Uh, we're hopeful that they'll find March inefficient for what it is they're trying to do, and, and we believe there's still logic. Um, so we still have the facilities available. Um, we still would like to, to host them, but at this point in time, they've been operating at March ARB since October 1st. Uh, two other things. We've got some work we're going to be doing on runway 1735. What effect is that going to have on landing fees and airport revenue? Um, don't necessarily believe that's going to have a direct uh, effect on landing fees. The second part of your question, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Airport revenues, oh, I'm sorry. Um, we don't necessarily believe it's going to have a direct effect. I mean, we do have two runways. The, the alternate runway is, is about 10,000 feet. Um, so um, whether we rely principally on that or we use what's called a displaced threshold on the north-south runway, um, we, th we think operationally we can still um, um, basically reconstruct the runway without negatively impacting operations. One last thing is um, we talked about some delaying some capital improvement projects, um, airport safety being very high on everybody's list. Any of those delays? Not that we're aware. Of, not that we're aware of. Um, we have retooled our priorities over the years. Um, if you recall, it was probably three or four years ago. We were actually doing reconstruction work on the crosswind runway, uh, which is a shorter runway, and we uh, did replace a lot of runway section. Um, we found some very substantive safety concerns with respect to the structural integrity of runway 1735. So we've repurposed our priority to focus on that. Uh, but very simply put, you know, we, we have literally runway section constructed over substandard material, including just native material, which is not safe for some of the biggest aircraft that are landing out there. And what it's causing us to do is it's increasing our operating costs because we're having to go out and do a significant amount of repair um, patchwork basically to keep the the runway bubble gum together um, so this is really the right long-term fix uh, given the type of aircraft that are now flying in there thanks that's all I have I'll move approval of the uh, amendment to the <coughs> fiscal year budget second motion by mr. Kennedy second by Ms. Garcia all those in favor aye, aye. aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. D4, ratification of the acceptance of grant agreement. Uh, Madam Clerk, read the recommendation. Recommendation is that the Board of Directors ratify the acceptance of the grant agreement between the United States of America, acting through the Federal Aviation Administration and the Southern California Logistics Airport Authority in the amount of $7,322,000 $657 for the reconstruction of runway 1735 phase 2 and installation of guidance signs. I move for approval. Any questions? Second. Second. So, sorry. 
Motion by Ms. Gomez, second by Mr. Kennedy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Item D5, approval of application for State of California Department of Transportation Airport Improvement Program matching grant. Uh, Madam Clerk, read the uh, recommendation. The recommendation is that the Board of Directors approve resolution number SCLAA 17-005, authorizing certain staff to submit an application, accept funds, and execute a grant agreement for a State of California Department of Transportation Airport Improvement Program matching grant. Question? Madam Mayor, I just have a quick comment. Um, <coughs> as most people may know, I uh, <coughs> actually work out at Fort Irwin National Training Center. And, um, you know, being that we have a airport here in uh, Victorville is a tremendous <laughs> asset that uh, most cities would love to have. However, the cost of running a facility like that and the um, capabilities that we have um, are something that I think we can and should continue to invest in to increase the capabilities and make it more competitive. Um, I think, obviously, I'm here with the city tonight and in the daytime I work for the Army Department of Defense, but. Uh, through no fault of our staff, uh, it's unfortunate whenever you lose a uh, tenant that's been here for so, so long. Uh, but one of the uh, uh, issues that uh, made March Air Force Base, besides the Department of Defense directive to use DOD facilities primarily um, for any of these types of m movements, um, March Air Force, March Air Reserve Base uh, in May of this year opened what's known as the Joint Deployment Center because of the heavy use of military members moving through March to places all over the world. So they thought it made sense to actually build a DOD joint facility. So right now you've got the Air Force down there, the Marines and the Army, and um, it, there is no telling who else can use that facility. So it's a real asset for the Department of Defense, but uh, certainly we wish we could have kept uh, the Army up here at Fort Irwin. It is a great asset up here at SCLA. I just think uh, I'd be really interested to work with city staff to really look at what our plan is for the next few years uh, as we evolve with that asset and uh, try to improve its capabilities, make it make sure we're competitive. Thank you. <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. A motion. I move the item for approval. Second. Motion by Ms. Gomez, second by Mr. Negretti. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Item D6, standard lease agreement for building number 873. Madam Clerk, read the uh, recommendation. The recommendation is that the Board of Directors approve the standard lease agreement for building 873 by and between Karam Aircraft, Inc. and the Southern California Logistics Airport Authority. Questions? Comments? Motion? Move approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Ms. Garcia. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Item D7, assignment and assumption agreement, Hillcrest Court Apartments. Madam Clerk, read the uh, recommendation. The recommendation is that the Board of Directors authorize the execution of the Assignment and Assumption Agreement by and between the County of San Bernardino, the City of Victorville, acting as Housing Assets Successor, Amcal Hillcrest Court Fund LP and Hillcrest Court Apartments LLC, and authorize the Director of Economic Development as the authorized signer of all related loan transactional documents. Questions? Yes, I have one. Anybody else? Sophie, are you here? If, if, <coughs> if I'm understanding this assignment and assumption agreement, what's happening is that there's a six hundred and some thousand dollar receivable in the RDA that will be paid off to the successor agency and we'll give that money to wherever it flows. Am I right? 
the receivable was was with the RDA, but upon the dissolution, because it was a housing asset, and the loan receivable was transferred to the city in its capacity as housing uh, housing asset successor. So that is the entity that will receive the payoff. Uh, it is and was funded with NSP neighborhood stabilization program funds, and so it will be received as program income and have to be spent according to the NSP guidelines. But it, we will retain it. You will retain this will it. Not go to. It does not go through the other process where it's remitted to uh, pay off enforceable obligations or to the taxing entities. It stays with the city. So we bring that back into the NSP program. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I'll move approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Ms. Gomez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries <coughs> unanimously. Item D8, purchase of a switch gear from West Coast distribution from Big for Victorville Municipal Utility Services. Madam Clerk, read the recommendation. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the purchase of switchgear from Westco Distribution for the 12 KV electrical facilities located at the Foxborough Industrial Park. Question? None? Uh, need a motion? Move approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Cox, second by Ms. Gomez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Item D9, inclusion of properties within the territory of the City of Victorville in various open pace program. Uh, Madam Clerk, read the recommendation. Any subject action or further direction for staff is at the discretion of the City Council. I do have some cards on this item here. The first one that I have is Dustin Riley, and after Dustin is Bob Schumann. Hello, Mayor and Council. Thanks for having me back again. I appreciate it. Um, your clerk has probably provided you with a little updated uh, segment here. Your staff has done an incredible job in reaching out and doing the things that previously you directed them to do, uh, reaching out to SBCTA to get some of the answers uh, to some of those questions, which was great. Uh, there's been a lot of legislation this year that got passed uh, in the state at the state level, SB 242 as well as AB uh, 1284 that provide a lot of consumer protections uh, as well as contractor standards as well as the Department of Business Oversight actually overseeing PACE providers in the state to make sure that there's not going to be any type of uh, issues that come up amongst your uh, uh, contractors and homeowners and that relationship. Uh, realize that PACE is a mechanism that was created at the state level and it's just an option and making that option available to your constituents is key. In that packet that I provided to you on the left hand side what you'll see is a couple of happy homeowner quotes. Uh, where people didn't want to put their entire uh, name and a, a story behind it. And behind that are actually a couple of letters from local homeowners that utilized uh, the HERO program to be able to do financing upgrades at their homes, whether it be for a roof or uh, for some sort of uh, solar or HVAC or doors and window upgrade at their home. And on the right-hand side, what you will see is you will actually see uh, some of the results in the past that you've had here in the city of Victorville and as well uh, pace with uh, the improved and uh, regulated form to be able to kind of be uh, one of those things that you can kind of take a snit bit and look at it and, and know exactly what's going on. I, I know your staff's provided a lot of detail for you. I know that uh, SBCTA uh, is interested in even taking a look again at this program. So uh, I hope that, uh, that with some of the different testimony you see tonight or here tonight, that you will af actually move forward with this as a voluntary option for your constituents. Thank you for your time and have a great evening. Yes, sir. 
What exactly do you want from the city of Victorville or from the city <laughs> council? What, what, what yeah, just mean? passing a resolution to make this program voluntarily available is all that uh, the request is. So it's just passing a resolution for the open pace program and each of the resolutions that are before you this evening so that you can uh, make it voluntarily available to your constituents. Is, is there any reason it wouldn't be voluntarily available if we don't pass a resolution? Uh, yeah, it's actually not available unless you pass a resolution because what you're doing is enabling the county of uh, San Bernardino to actually put this onto a, a homeowner's property tax bill as a voluntary assessment against their own property. So it's a, pro a, a private property right uh, uh, issue is what it is and it cannot be made available without that resolution being passed and you can check with the city attorney on that I'm sure. So as, as a municipal governing body we decide whether or not people can participate in this program? To make it voluntarily available, you would say yes uh, to this resolution. Otherwise, there's not the availability of this program in your community. What kind of availability is there other than voluntary? I don't understand that oh, term, well, voluntarily available. Voluntarily available, meaning this is not something that's being mandated on any homeowner. It's not something that's being mandated if I decide to utilize it, yet Mayor and, and uh, Councilman Kennedy, you don't decide to use it. It doesn't affect you as a homeowner at all. It only affects me as the local homeowner and my own personal property tax bill. And, and have we resolved the question <laughs> of whether it gets into a position ahead of the first mortgage or behind it? Does it have to be paid off when the sale occurs for that property? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the answer to that is that it is in the first position because you cannot subordinate the property tax bill that is actually the county's property tax bill. So what that means is it is in the first position, but there have been no foreclosures by any PACE provider in the state of California. And there's been over 150,000 homes that have been upgraded utilizing PACE in the state of California. So there haven't been any foreclosures. And what we look to is we look to that first mortgage lender to make sure that they are made whole and that they have the ability to work with their local homeowner. So at time of a sale or a refinance, it can be paid off. And in most, in most cases, it is paid off during a sale unless it's a, um, a non-FHFA loan. If it's an FHA back loan for the person buying the property, they've actually given guidance back on 719 of 2016 that it's okay for the PACE assessment to remain with the tax bill. Um, but if it is an FHFA, that means Freddie or Fannie property, it does need to be paid off at the time of the sale of that property. And we make that very clear to home owners up front and that's part of the disclosure process that was put into a lot of the uh, disclosure forms from AB 2693 in 2016 as well as AB uh, 1284 and SB 242 in this last session. A homeowner makes a decision to buy a home enters into an agreement with a lender that that lender's loan is in first position. Mm -hmm. They both agree on this. That's correct. Later on, the homeowner decides to take advantage of the PACE program, pushes the lender into a second position without ever having to negotiate an, a new agreement with the lender, and the lender has anything to say about it? Yeah, that? it sounds weird that way, but really, uh, in, in practical sense, um, they're not, they are in a second position because of the property tax bill, but PACE providers are not acting upon that and it's not good for the public eye to have any type of foreclosures. So what happens really in a reality situation is look at our market when we had the downfall back in 2005, six, seven, eight. Um, what happens is lenders step in to protect their position. And if a person is six months or 12 months behind on their property tax bill, they pay that property tax bill to make sure that the county is not going to foreclose on the property. The same exact thing would happen in this scenario and that's why we've created since the beginning before we did our first 120,000 uh, uh, assessments for our company we created a reserve fund where we actually have an internal reserve to where we can help out to make sure that that portion that the lender had to pay off can be taken care of so the lender doesn't have to eat any of that portion so we're protecting the lenders first position absolutely sir That answers your questions. Thank you. Thank you.
Bob Schumann. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Vice President of Policy and Government Relations for Counterpoint Energy Solutions. We're a PACE program uh, administrator. And I don't think I'll need my three minutes, but I wanted to, to just kind of lay out a little practical use of how, how PACE works in the home. If, if you wanted to put solar on your home, have a contractor come out, he says, this is how much it's going to cost. Well, depending on your financial situation, you have options available to you. If you've got disposable cash in that amount, you can pay cash. If you have that kind of limit on your credit card, you can use a credit card. A lot of these contractors have their own financing program. There's a home equity line of credit, and then there's pays. And I think most of us, in our experience, when we've done home improvements or, or major investments, you sit down and you decide which program is best for me, which form of financing is best for my family. And we, we're just part of a financial stack. We're just one option. And, and from a more practical standpoint, and, and this is where PACE really is valuable, uh, if let's say that, that your HVAC system breaks down and has to be replaced, it can't be repaired. If, again, if you have the cash, you can pay the cash. If you have the credit card limit, you can pay the credit card limit. But if you don't have good credit, you're not going to be able to get a loan from the HVAC company. You're not going to be able to get a HELOC loan. The PACE loan is actually on the house. So if you have sufficient equity in your home and you can demonstrate an ability to pay, we'll finance it. And it's quick. So you can get your HVAC system installed fairly quickly. So there's a practical aspect to it. And, and keep in mind also that our funds can only be used for energy and water home improvements. We can't, we can't do your runway and we can't do kitchens and we can't do bathrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did anybody? Uh, I have uh, Mary Gonsalu. Uh, Gons Gons okay. And then after Mary will be Jeff. Uh, Simonetti, <laughs> I'm having a hard time with these names. Hello, I've never done this before. This is my first time. Oh, I've never done this before, my first time. So um, I am part of the HERO program. Um, we've had a lot of financial, medical um, things that kind of made our credit not so good, but the roof on our house was really bad. It was leaking. We tried financing with all different companies. We couldn't get a loan. The HERO program came along and we were able to get our roof put on our home. And thank goodness it was just before all the rain started. And um, basically that helped us. It's on our property taxes. So we actually get a little bit of a deal there when we do our, our taxes. It actually helped us there too. Um, and it will be paid off <coughs> in 20 years. And then my mortgage payment is how we paid off. It's through our mortgage payment. So, because I have an escrow fund, I don't know if you need to have any other answers or. Well, but the I, Hero program is what helped me get my roof on my house. I have <laughs> a question. Is your home in the city of Victorville? Yes, it is. So we don't need to take any action at all. The Hero program is already in effect. I see no. So how did you get the HERO program? We haven't adopted it yet. Well, this has been, um, it's a couple, it's been like two years ago. Mayor Pro Tem Cox, the yeah. HERO program expired June 30th of this year. Yeah. Uh, it, okay. was, it was run through, uh, formerly Sandbag, now SB COG, and it expired. The board uh, decided not to continue it, I believe, at their May meeting. So I'm just here to say no that it's available. a very good program. And I wanted to, to stay I was around for. I'm confused because I know there yeah. was a request that we adopt it and it's not in effect. I wondered how it happened, but thank you, uh, Doug, for explaining. Yes. I'm just here to say that it's a very good program, and without that, I wouldn't have no roof on my house. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff Simonetti. Good evening, Mayor Garcia and members of the council. My name is Jeff Simonetti, and I'm speaking on behalf of Renew Financial this evening, and uh, just wanted to urge your support for the PACE resolutions before you. Just wanted to reiterate a few points uh, that uh, my colleague Dustin had mentioned. First, wanted to say thank you to Janelle Davidson and all the staff for helping us out throughout this process. And since we began discussions with the city back earlier this year, we believe that we've addressed a lot of the concerns that initially had to come up, in particularly related to finance, financing transparency and consumer protection. So during this year, there have been three pieces of legislation that have passed, including AB 2693, 
AB 1242 and SB 242, which specifically address the issues of consumer protection and also financial transparency so that when customers related to the PACE program, uh, before they get involved in, in the program, they understand what their payment terms are, what the payment requirements are, and there's, there's much more financial transparency than there was at the beginnings of this program. We believe that all of these combined have substantially addressed a lot of the initial concerns that uh, the city has had, and we urge your support this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Those were all the cards that I have. Is, is this program somehow limited to, to only people who can't finance some other way? In other words, is it focused and limited for low-income folks? Or no, council member. Available uh, to anybody. It, anybody who is a homeowner is eligible for it. Um, it is another option, as the speakers have talked about. Um, I think for uh, lower-income individuals or people who have had some credit uh, struggles. It may be the only option available to them, um, but it is available to any homeowner. Mm -hmm. Questions? Comments? Yeah, if you're asking the, from council, I do have. Yes, I, I, those were the only cards that I had. So now I'm asking council if they have any kind of. Okay, so in mid-October, I sent an email out to the appropriate staff at SBCOG and SBCTA with the following response to what I got. April 2017, SBCOG, SBCTA board considered an item to renew the contract with the companies that administered the PACE program for us, known as the HERO program. Staff recommended was to renew the contract. However, much of after discussion, there was a motion to accept the recommendation, but no second for the motion was received for that item that was approved. During the conversation among the board members, one of them pointed out that it was un understood that there were some benefits to the program, but there were also some complaints from residents about the contract's behavior. Since 2017, there has been some renewed le legislation that has gone through in effect. The bills, SB 242 and SB 1284, as Dustin me mentioned during this public comment. The bills codify some of the consumer protections that were already being used by HERO and enacted new consumer protections as well. And the summary of the new protections are listed in the agenda, as you guys have probably already read. And these aren't major issues that are holding anything back. These are federal government issues that don't affect us here in California. And I agree with um, the Exhibit B's letter, Carl Tate and the public speakers, that there is a right for the property owners and they should have the choices to be able to decide what, what properties what it is that the property that they want to come about and be able to purchase if that's there. So I don't think council should negate or hinder any of that. That's my opinion. I have a motion. We we'll have a comment after the motion. Go ahead. Oh, no. After you have the motion and second, I have a comment before we vote. Thank the you. <laughs> this, is a, this is a program that seems to have a lot of benefits. Has some some things that cause me some concern. One of them is that the normal lending practices that go into extending credit to an individual or family are, as I see it, they seem to be sort of ignored. They're, they because it goes on the property tax bill, it's going to get paid sooner or later by somebody. Uh, but it, I, I'm bothered by what it does to the lender in first position. But I think what's bothering me the most is the County Transportation Authority, who was sponsoring this program in the county, uh, decided a few months ago to pull back from it. Um, and it was because there were complaints and there were problems with the program. And I just, you know, we're listening to people who are advocating for the program who are engaged in it. They're in the business of doing this program. Uh, they want us to approve this. They, they want the program to go forward. But, but I don't expect them to give us a balanced presentation. I don't expect them to come up here and tell us what all the problems are with the program because they're promoting it. So that's, that's where I am. I'm kind of stuck on this thing. I just, I'm not, I don't want to deny people the opportunity to use it. 
But I'm also not sure we're doing anybody any favors by saying you go ahead and borrow money that you can't afford to, to borrow by any other means and then work with contractors that may or may not give you what you think you're buying. Uh, those are my concerns. I Madam Mayor, I have a quick comment uh, or actually a question for the city manager. Um, I believe that uh, the previous programs and this particular program, uh, that there may be some confusion, but as I understand it, we've had uh, so have resolved many of the issues uh, that that plague these types of programs. Um, and I was under the impression I'd act like uh, a city manager, hopefully, to uh, explain maybe just a little bit of things that were changed since the, the, we initially started considering this, um, because I, I do remember there was uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, concern, but I believe it's here today because I thought we had worked through that. Um, and, oh, by the way, uh, isn't it true that if there were any issues, we could also cancel this? Um, so they have made several changes. Um, uh, in addition, uh, there was two bills passed, as they mentioned, um, that have that look to resolve uh, many of the issues that that uh, I'll say that staff had previously with the Hero program, two separate programs, um, and uh, a lot of the the hard lessons learned in the Hero program uh, appear to be being resolved. Um, the, uh, the concerns that we had previously, when we were a member of HERO uh, had to do with contractors um, representing that the city had approved this or that they were approved contractors and sort of using the city's weight or might, if you will, as an endorsement and that wasn't the, the intent. Um, I know that the, the current providers uh, are very sensitive to that and they have uh, terminated contracts of contractors who have done that, uh, those sorts of things, where um, I think it gets a little bit sticky and actually Dustin, I thought, did a very balanced presentation um, where it gets sticky uh, for uh, homeowners uh, and some of the things that have been said in the past that I appreciate that Dustin didn't say tonight is that um, the law doesn't say that um, you have to take that first position um, or that you have to pay off the loan in order to transfer the, the property to, to buy the property um, but based on experiences from realtors and, and people that we simply know, um, the banks have generally decided that although the law doesn't require you to do it, they're not gonna move forward without it being paid off. So ultimately, that created some, some burdens for some homeowners, and we have you know, anecdotally some stories along those lines. Um, I'm that dug because they couldn't sell it without paying it off. Yeah, and, and there have been cases, although, you know, anybody who's purchased a home, you know, you sign a lot of documents. And a lot of those documents are disclosures. And, you know, at least with me, uh, I will admit when I've, you know, purchased a property or sold a property, which I haven't done a lot of, after about 10 pages in, you stop reading and you just want to get through the two-inch stack. You just start, okay, this in there, and you're, you know, the escrow or the realtor says, well, this is for this. Okay, thank you. Okay, this next one's for this. And, you know, it can get caught up. Um, I think that the current providers have done a good job of, of trying to combat that. But if you opt in, you will have some homeowners who get into the program and struggle because of it when they go to sell a house. That will happen. I think that's what we've heard from the realtors. Um, the realtors have uh, historically been opposed they aren't here tonight, but they have not lifted their opposition, I will say, um, because it is one more thing for them to do that can be difficult at the transfer of a property. Um, you know, this is, this is a program that has very good qualities and some qualities that are problematic. Um, that's why you don't see a recommendation from staff on here. Uh, let me ask this question, two-part question. Can we approve it without endorsing it? And can we approve it for a one-year period and review it and renew it, our, you, our approval, once a year? You want to answer that? I can answer that one. Yeah, if I you would want assume you can do both of those. Yeah, and you can do both of those. The resolutions do provide that you have the ability to withdraw from it to it at any point yeah. if, to the extent you and don't. Specifically to your first back, part of the though, question. What the results are so specifically to the first part of your question. Um, the PACE providers understand, and they are making sure that their contractors understand that this is not an endorsement from the city. It simply is allowed. 
Uh, and that is something that, that caused staff, uh, including myself, to recommend against uh, renewing or against adding uh, providers to the old HERO program. In fact, before SB COG um, decided not to continue with the program, I was advocating that we not only not allow additional providers, but based on negative interactions, that we actually revoke uh, those resolutions previously. So uh, based on all of that input, based on all of this learning process from not just the providers, but also from the legislature, um, it appears to be improving and has improved. But we don't have any experience, uh, nor does anybody have any experience with these two new laws because they don't take effect until January 1st, as all laws do. So while they look good, you don't really know, really, really know until you've got a little bit of experience. So you could certainly limit it. Um, you could revoke it at any time, and it, and it very clearly is not an endorsement. And, and in fairness, the, the people promoting this, and I see this, you've done everything you can to, to deal with these problems. I, I, I think we all see that. So if I, made, uh, if I may add, I've seen how the PACE providers have already proved themselves in this program to be valid based on the forward steps taken to lobby legislation to improve the HERO program. I'm seeing how this program just expired June 30th, and I'm not really seeing the issue. What is the problem with the extension when they've taken those appropriate steps to make sure that the city of Victorville and the community have these options available to them? <coughs> and so that's, that's what I had to share. Yeah, and just, just for information's sake, there are four separate resolutions. There are four uh, separate providers who you would be uh, resolving to allow to do this type of business within Victorville. Um, and if, if one of those four uh, were not a good player, if one of them were a bad player uh, and discovered that, you could uh, revoke simply that one resolution and allow the other three. Um, I, I can tell you that I think there's a likelihood that if these are approved at some point, um, that I know that there's other providers in the mix out there that, that may very likely come forward uh, to talk to you uh, additionally. So with the attorney's assistance, I would like to be able to incorporate um, Kennedy's concerns and be able to process this even if it's uh, on a one-year basis, if that's, if that's what it takes to be able to move forward and see how this PACE program is going to be in the next year. Yeah, what you could do is whoever makes a motion could make the motion that the resolutions be modified to reflect that the approval is for a one-year period and that the revocation provision still remains, so you could revoke it even before that, but your approval is limited to a one-year period and review it again at the end of that one year. So if the, if the council agrees to that, I think I'd like to make that the motion. Second. I would like to make my comment now. Yes, go ahead. I think there, um, almost everything has uh, been covered. Um, the question that I had was, can the city opt out if they're having bad experience? The answer is yes. That took care of a large portion. Um, secondly, uh, since this came to the council, I have looked at it. And one of the things that uh, I have found out, there are several low-income homes, or individuals who have low income, that could not get loans and could not use the program because we had to pass the resolution. And they were looking at uh, double glassing the house, not the solar, uh, for simply to save energy. And my concern was, which has now been answered, if it doesn't work, uh, can we opt out? We can. So in the meantime, um, I agree with the motion in a second with, with a caution, or no, with an understanding we don't want staff to wait a year from now and advertise we're going to review it um, and then uh, get the information and hear from people we haven't heard from before. I think we have to ask staff to keep records and at least at the end of the year or before, if we're having problems, bring it back to the council so we, we can uh, probably monitor this to have assurance that it's either working or not working so a year from now if it's working and everyone's happy, we can, we can take the action. And if it's not working and we find that out within six months, we can actually pull it, but somehow have the staff involved in the process and not wait a year from now and say, okay, staff, what do you have? And say nothing because you didn't authorize us to be monitoring it or keeping records or anything else. I, I just, it doesn't have to be a part of the motion, but I just wanted to understand if the council agree. The council, the staff may have to create a file for this so that, uh, and if something comes up, they will in fact uh, let all the council members know 
that it's either working or not working so that we don't have to worry about it, that they are watching it. And it with that, I'm prepared. <coughs> to make a, just a comment on that. And it, just so the council is aware that there's, there's nothing in these resolutions nor in the program that requires uh, either the providers or the homeowners to come to the city. Right. Um, so uh, th there's two ways to handle it. One would be to make modifications to the resolution and bring it back, or um, simply we have the four, I'm sure we have all four providers out here or they will know about it. And I think it's you, the expectation is clear from the city council to both the providers and the staff uh, that we need to know what you're doing. We need reports uh, on these things so that we can report back to the council and you know, six months from now or whatever uh, the council wishes. Um, if we have heard nothing from one of these providers, then that's what we'll report and you can take the appropriate action. I, I don't necessarily, I'm sorry, I don't necessarily see a need to modify these as long as we understand that we're adopting the resolution and we do have some sort of responsibility to the homeowners that take advantage of this. And so if there is a complaint they don't make a phone call and they're told, too bad, too bad, you know, get an attorney and file a civil action. I want them to know that they can come back to the city and let us know that there's a problem and we are going to listen. Normally, this would be between um, buyer or seller. It would be private. We wouldn't be involved. But if we are, and if we don't adopt the resolution, it is between buyer and seller. But if we're going to adopt the resolution to authorize these companies to be involved in this program, then I think that we have some responsibility to monitor it. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Uh, would you talk me out of this? N not at all, sir. But <laughs> what, what I would like to offer up, and I think that I could speak for all of us as providers, we'd be willing to work with your staff locally to be able to even provide quarterly reports to them uh, at, from every provider so that you can actually have that report in front of you, know what projects are happening in your backyard, and allow you those decision-making uh, abilities so that we can continue the program uh, forward. So on a quarterly basis, we'd have no problem doing that. that Thank you very help. much. Thank you so much. Um, do you have a motion from Councilmember Gomez to adopt all four resolutions subject to the programs terminating within one year? And a second by Mr. Kennedy. And a second. Who, who seconded? Kennedy. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Now we, we move on to item D10. 41st Amendment to Law Enforcement Contract. Madam Clerk, <coughs> read the recommendation. The recommendation is that the City Council ratify the 41st Amendment to Law Enforcement Contract Number 94-909-A-41 for the period of January 6, 2018 through June 30, 2018 and authorize the Mayor or her des designee to process all documents required for the agreement. Question? Yes, I have a question. Um, would you be able, I have the Schedule A here, would you be able to pr provide a ba uh, breakdown only of the first item and then thereof, I, I can understand the rest. For instance, we have captain, it's labeled of service captain and then it has under cost 340,651. So I wanted to know it, what that particular item <laughs> relates to. Is it a salary? Is it, I, I don't know what it is, so I just need to understand that. That's the total cost uh, from the county for providing that position. It's not salary. Um, I, I think John would be thrilled if it was salary, but um, that is a total cost of, of uh, that position, including benefits um, and the all-in cost for that. That because we have one captain? Yes. All right, I have no further questions. Madam Mayor, move approval. Second. Uh, of the First Amendment to the law enforcement contract. You know, I take that back. I actually have another one. The other thing was, this is a modification of the contract. Is it possible to add uh, community meetings with the contract being modified now, or is that at a later date? Um, that's not something that's covered by the contract one way or another. Um, that'd be more of a request to the Sheriff's Department. So I was advised that when there's a modification of the police contract to be able to insert something so there's a modification so I wasn't sure if it's now or do I have to wait at a later time? Um, that's probably something that would need to wait okay. uh, only because that's an actual modification to the whole contract. Um, this is just a modification to 
to the schedule of employees. This adds a school resource officer um, to work in the high schools, and that, that's all it does. It's not modifying any terms within the contract itself, just for the, the number of, of police officers that we have working for us. Thank you. I have no further questions. <coughs> There's a motion by Mr. Cox, second by Mr. Kennedy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Item D11, joining the Taking Back Our Community Coalition. Madam Clerk, uh, read the uh, recommendation. The recommendation is that the City Council adopt resolution number 17-060 to join the Taking Back Our Community Coalition, approve the associated annual expenditure to support stated objectives, and authorize the City Manager to appoint one or more representatives to participate in meetings. Uh, yes, I don't know if there's a presentation. I thought there would be. I don't. I didn't have enough information. So <coughs> I was wondering, is this an additional expense? Um, when did we approve the budget to incorporate eighteen thousand dollars for this program? And furthermore, I'd like to let the audience know that we had a committee come in here. We, I'm sorry, we had a the High Desert Community Coalition asking to have a committee to be able to implement some kind of protection for the for public, whether it was with drinking and storefronts, but that was not heard. The request was not taken forth. Um, then recently on November 21st, there was another gentleman, um, Mr. Stevens, who asked uh, city council to be able, or the mayor, to be able to do public service meetings and if we would be involved, and again, it was not taken into consideration. And so my concern is if we're having the community do this kind of citizenry and want to be involved, um, how do we bypass them, but yet we add something on the agenda that is as such. So I want to point out and, make, and point out to your attention the HUD rule for af affirmatively furthering fair housing, because this is how it relates to Assembly Bill 109, 47, and 57. HUD released the final rule to equip communities that receive HUD funding with the data and the tools that will help them to meet longstanding fair housing obligations and the use of HUD funds. HUD will provide publicly open data for guarantees to use the, assess, the assessment to state a fair housing with their communities and to set locally determined priorities and goals. The rules to respond recommendation of the Government Accountability Office and the stakeholders for HUD to enhance its fair housing planning obligations is to provide the, gr the greater clarity and to support the jurisdiction receiving HUD funding. And the reason I even brought that up and started reading that is because we are in the business of helping rehabilitate individuals instead of spending thousands and thousands of dollars on the prison cells or even in our community. So I wanted to advocate on that behalf because a lot of the times we oversee and supersede and um, do not see how there's benefits in rehabilitating individuals that were incarcerated at one point and come down to the city and we don't create an environment for them to be welcomed. So I was a little bit concerned that it, the narrative might just be one-sided and of course I needed more information on what this coalition was going to do. So I'm not sure where 18000 came from. The, the cost of the city would be $1,500. Uh, we have that amount available uh, within the city manager's department budget to, to be able to pay that. Um, and what that would go towards is uh, building a website and producing uh, informational materials uh, regarding uh, the unintended consequences of AB 109 and propositions 47 and 57. Um, <coughs> the, the stated goals for those uh, generally had to do a lot with overcrowding of our prisons and uh, the legislature, uh, at least with AB 109, wanted to define uh, how that would be addressed. Um, ultimately, there have been some crimes committed by individuals released uh, because of AB uh, 109. In fact, there was a Whittier police officer uh, and that was really sort of the genesis of, of this. And uh, this is not a political action committee. Uh, they're not trying to, uh, to repeal or replace uh, any of these propositions or AB 109. Uh, their only purpose uh, is to just raise public awareness um, of some of the crimes that have increased as a result uh, of, these, of these actions of both the, the voters of California and the legislature to provide consistent messages and then also to advocate uh, for the state to make 
changes to improve law enforcement's ability to respond to crime. <coughs> um, it, it was interesting. I actually chair the San Bernardino County uh, City Managers Group, part of the SBCOG, SBCTA. Um, and uh, we had a presentation from uh, one of the city managers from the San Gabriel Valley. Um, and uh, at this point in the process, uh, they're just looking for, for help. Um, to try to do something uh, to curb some of the negative effects um, of uh, these uh, these new laws that have been enacted, um, I do know that uh, that the League of Cities recently talked about this at their uh, their leadership conference, which our deputy city manager George Harris was at. Uh, George, I don't know if you can share. I don't know how much of that was in public meetings or not, but uh, if whatever you can share about the, the league's actions, which is really the intent of these cities was to try to get more of a statewide discussion about um, uh, you know, making our state safer a as a whole, George. That's correct. Uh, this past week, um, the League of California Cities hosted its annual goal setting um, session where um, the board and leaders of the various divisions of the league uh, organized to pretty much set the, the top three goals for the, for the league's activities leading into next calendar year. And these three items actually were culminated into the, the topic of public safety, and it became the number one goal of the League of California Cities for 2018. And so they will be spending quite a bit of attention as a result of that on first analyzing the unintended consequences of, of the passage of these three bills, as well as pr proposing specific strategies and which may lead to further legislation uh, for cities to, to try to cope with these issues. So um, the other two items that were listed as the top three uh, goals for the, for the year were uh, specifically dealing with uh, protecting transportation revenues and dealing with um, pension, pension costs. And so uh, those, are, those are two very strong uh, additional goals, but the, these particular or this particular concept ended up number one on their list. Well, the goal of the coalition really is to just just have consistent uh, branded messaging across the state, so we're all saying the same things. Uh, and what this would do is uh, get us access to those things, uh, but it also gets us a seat at the table um, as uh, they and we uh, kind of work through this issue. Uh, so that's that's why I put it on the agenda and uh, would recommend uh, approval. Madam Mayor, I have a comment. Um, usually I refrain from commenting on uh, issues that deal with the state of California uh, because unless you live in Los Angeles or San Francisco, uh, you probably don't feel uh, comfortable with the direction this, this state is going. And quite frankly, uh, AB 109, Prop 47, Prop 57. Uh, I guess they like homeless people in LA and San Francisco. They love it. And I'm, I'm getting really tired of these things that come out of the state government impacting our limited resources here in Victorville. And it's not like we have a lifeline. Let me just put it out there. If you're not in LA or San Francisco, it's like you're a stepchild in the state. What do we got? More Democrats than Republicans? So what, we, we, just, we just live with these policies? I could say a lot more about this, and then you take that in conjunction with marijuana and what that's done. It's, it's ridiculous. Then, and then throw in the homeless problem. So all of these things put together cumulatively are having a negative impact, and we're supposed to be silent. So, so uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I just, you know, I sit here and I uh, try to be productive. But thank you, uh, city staff, for putting this on the agenda. Um, there, there are many uh, issues uh, like this that have a negative impact. And we just had a uh, half percent sales tax increase on the, uh, on the ballot to address some of these issues. And we've grown in population. We doubled in size in the last 15 years. And our services cannot simply keep up. Fire department and uh, sheriff's department. 
so again, when you reduce a uh, felony to a misdemeanor and you've got homeless people violating all kinds of, uh, of, of, of laws, but now those laws really don't, uh, they don't count as much as they used to. And guess what? These people know that. They're coming from other states. They're coming from other places because they know there's benefits here. 30% of, of the welfare in this country is from this state. And then being homeless, that's not a crime. So then they do things, and what are we supposed to do? Call it overtaxed uh, sheriff's department? We don't have the resources, and this, we are identifying this as an issue, and I applaud all the other cities that are involved with this, and uh, I really hope Victorville uh, does this as well. So I have a question as well. Um, so is this 1500 yearly? Is it perpetual? How, how long is this going to be occurring? Uh, it's a yearly amount. Um, you know, one of the, the goals that uh, the city manager who presented to us talked about was to get the league actually to kind of take up the cause for this. And it, it <coughs> appears that's happening now. So um, I wouldn't expect it to be uh, uh, certainly not perpetual, um, but it is an annual amount, correct? So that's something that would be included in our budget next year. If it's adopted for this year, we would make sure that the funding was available for future years. And one other thing, let me reiterate, um, there has been two, three different groups coming to us to help make a committee. And we have had these information pieces have fallen on deaf ears. So this is not the first or the last time when community has come to want to help the homeless who has wanted to come to reduce crime building committees, making committees. It's not the first time. So if that's the language that you hear from city council this, this after or this evening, that's not the case. We put down we we basically said no to other committees. And so I don't know why we didn't add that plus then and then some to make it even more instead of sometimes complaining about the expenditures of our monies and whatnot. And so that's that's the main thing that I'm trying to bring um, to the table. If I'm at the table, I can speak on behalf of others and try to promote what it is that you want. But when the information falls on deaf ears, please keep on coming back and letting, an, uh, letting us know how you can help us partner with the city. Because I know there's organizations out there tonight that are going to be requesting that. And actually, my understanding, it, it's been a couple of months since I had that presentation, but my understanding is that they also welcome uh, other groups, not just cities, community groups. So whether it's our, our root organization or the community coalition, uh, they can also get involved with this. Uh, I don't believe that there's a fee for those community groups. Just off the top of my head, I can't make promises for them. But as I recall, it was the city members who were being asked to, to help with a little bit of funding to set up the website and, and produce the materials, but that actually uh, there are community groups who are also uh, uh, joining the coalition. If there's no further questions, I'd like to uh, move. I, I have one card oh, here. <coughs> um, Robert Harriman. Good evening, Council. Uh, I'd like to add on to uh, Councilman Negretti. Um, <sighs> Measure K was there for us. It was right there for us, and we blew it. But I'd like to address the homeless. I am sick and tired of helping the homeless. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, this is just getting insane, okay? I, th there's encampments by my home, okay? How, what more do we need to do? Because people, have, obviously, nobody can come up with a good, solid answer. I have seen nothing to help visually in our community. It has only gotten worse. So, so I'm, I'm confused as to what the expectations are, I mean, what are they? We have a bad problem. Now, uh, six months ago, I spoke with the sheriff's department who reached out to me because I have addressed the homeless issue before. And they were going to be a little more active about 
Homeless people with shopping carts. Now, of course, they've all got uh, baby carriages. And um, I don't see that anymore. I don't know if it's because of a funding thing or, or, or what have you. But the city manager with this resolution is to appoint two people to this. Yeah, so Bob, it, it really, it, we could have multiple people. It, it's really kind of a staff function that uh, we would have somebody attend and bring back information to share with the city council. So an appointee would be a city employee? Okay. All right. That's all I have to say. Thank you. That was the last card that I had. Um, Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, very simple. This is a unified message advocating for common sense changes to the California's criminal justice system that addresses the unintended consequences of these bills. We need, this city needs a uniform message and I'm thankful that the other cities are getting involved, and I hope that will grow. And especially it's cities not just in the desert, but outside the areas this can't possibly hurt. There's all kinds of side issues that are going to come to play. We're going to address this again and again. But for now, we have an opportunity to assist in a unified message for the small fee of 1500 I think that we need to move on this uh, rather quickly. If there's not a motion, I make the motion. If there's a motion, I second it. I do have another card, and I think they're bringing Freddie another made one. Freddie made the motion, or at least he was trying to. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Maggie? Good evening, Your Honor, Council. Councilman Negretti, God bless you. God thank you. You normally don't speak, um, and when you do, I hear you. We hear you. I hear you. Um, back when Captain Sam was here, not that long ago, um, we had a lot of discussions after the meeting, long after the meeting. I think we were like the last two people in here. I haven't subjected Captain Schuler to that for the most part. Um, and I express my concerns about the changes I've seen in this city and this homelessness is just out of control. And I just asked a simple question to Captain Sam, he said, right there, he said, well, Maggie, what, we can we, what can we do about it? We're talking about the homelessness and all that. I said, it's too late. We already let the dogs out, like the song says. Who let the dogs out? We let the dogs out right here. We didn't get it under wraps as a city from the jump. So you know the old saying? And I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just, I'm just observing. The old saying about an ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of cure. Now we gotta figure out how to cure a rampant problem. I do not like going to my grocery store and having some 25, 35, 45 year old, especially a man, hit me up. And you know what I respond? Especially if it's a young person. What are you doing asking an old woman for money, followed by some other conversation which is not fit for public. And, and it's not that I'm not compassionate. It's not that I'm not a Christian. It's just that I want my city back. That's what I want. So whatever it takes to eradicate it, let's be done with it. And Councilman Negretti is spot on. Spot on. Unless you're living in bleeding heart, ultra liberal San Francisco or LA or money rich Orange County, the rest of us are off the grid politically. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more, and I believe this is the last one. Richard Gomez. <coughs> Good evening, Your Honor, Mayor and Mayor uh, Pro Tem and city council members and the city manager, assistant city manager and the deputy city, city manager. I have some questions that they will answer right now. I'm the owner of USA Veterans Helping Veterans. I received last week 121 calls of some comments that came out of here about the veterans, 
did pass away. Uh, but what we're doing over here, and what I'm doing over here, okay, I'm asking if we can be put on the agenda the first city council meeting in January, because I'm bringing in directors from the VA, the VA hospitals, and the VFWs, American Legions, AMBETS, my corporations, and other corporations. We have picked out, or we're looking at this place right here. Uh, Evergreen Technical Trade Center is for the homeless to, feed, uh, to not only feed them, to retrain them, but we need two to 300 acres. That's why I mentioned your names right there, because we want to put Veterans Town USA over here. And we've been trying to get survey everything and the water plane to see that it can be done. Okay, I agree to, uh, with every one of these speakers. We don't want uh, vet homeless veterans out there, and I'm sure neither do none of you. But we need to fix something that's broken. I'm not going to disrespect a veteran that went and fought for my freedom and yours and everybody else's freedom. The commander of the post where I left from is for Derwin to go to Vietnam during that season, 67, 69. I know the commander. We put together out there, we have that parade now for all us returning veterans. But if he, these things can be fixed, we're doing it across the United States. The reason why I asked for, uh, I said, American Legions, AMBETS, and VFWs, every single one of them have service officers. That's their job, to rehabilitate, rehabilitate the, the veterans that are returning, the ones that have already, and the ones that have passed away. We can help, but I need to sit down with the city manager and stuff and show him what we're doing so he can be in the loop and so we can get this homeless people off the streets. And uh, that's what I needed to say, but I want to be on the agenda uh, with those representatives here, the first uh, city council meeting in January, and I don't come alone. And I'd appreciate you know the, the time you could give me for that. I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm here to help, and that's who we are. So I thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If there's no further discussion, I'd like to. Yeah, uh, I, I actually have a question in regards to the appointment. So um, you said city staff is going to be appointed. Is it a specific number? How do you just hand select? How is it, that process going to occur? Are they going to go to those meetings? Is it monthly, weekly? Is there expense paid for driving back and forth? Are they reporting back to council? What, are, what will we hear back? Um, I don't have those details at this point. Um, what they are asking for it, as I understand it, is uh, a staff member, or if we'd like to send a couple, uh, just to be involved in the process, uh, to be able to bring those materials and bring those ideas back to uh, the city so that as they are doing sort of public relations campaigns to educate, that we uh, bring those things back uh, to uh, our city as well. Further questions? Move adoption of resolution number 17-060. Second. Motion by Mr. Negretti, second by Mr. Cox. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Now we move on to item D12. Purchase of two thermoplastic pre-melters. Um, Madam Clerk, read the uh, recommendation. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the award of contract to Roadline Products, Inc. in the amount of $40,190.75 for the purchase of two thermoplastic pre-melters. <coughs> Approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Ms. Gomez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Item D13, interagency safe route to school project rejection of all bids. Uh, Madam Clerk, read the recommendation. The recommendation is that the City Council rejects all bids opened on November 21st, 2017 for the Interagency Safe Route to School project and authorize staff to re-advertise the project. 
I do have a question in regards to this item, if I may speak. Yes, go ahead. So for intra-agency safe route to school project sounds like a very important project. There's no brief description of what it is because it's a bidding process that's going in the works, I believe. But what is there a partnership with the schools? What is it that entails these school projects? Is it a safety concern? I don't understand. Um, this item is um, not so much a partnership with schools, but we work very closely with the schools interagency, I believe, in the, ca in the sense that uh, this is a grant that was awarded both to the city of Victorville as the lead agency and Atalanto piggybacked on. Um, and, and the very basic goal of this project, and I believe there was nine schools, um, I could be wrong about that, but the, throughout uh, Victorville and Atalanto, most of which are in Victorville, uh, where the goal was to literally create a safe route by improving missing links of sidewalk from neighborhoods effectively to schools. So you don't have that effect <laughs> and you're eliminating the effect of say uh, kids and parents walking to school where they're changing uh, pavement services from dirt to, to, to sidewalk or, or even walking on the street for that fact. So th that's kind of the general overview of what the project is. Um, if there's any more specific details, certainly Brian Gengler is here in the audience. He could speak to um, um, perhaps the more particular such as which schools and what locations. No, I appreciate that. I, I understand where it's coming from. Thank you. I have no further questions. Approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Ms. Garcia. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Madam Mayor, I'm going to ask to be excused. I have a drive. Uh, item D14. Appointment of Carmen Cortinas to Community Services Advisory Committee. The uh, recommendation, any action is at the uh, discretion of the City Council. Madam Mayor, uh, this is my appointment for the Community Services Advisory Committee. And I'd just like to uh, thank all the folks that have uh, served on different committees over the years. Um, service isn't for everyone. Um, and a lot of times people ask, uh, you know, do you enjoy being on the council? Do you enjoy uh, service to the community? And uh, I do, I, I really do. And, uh, but the best part of it in, in, uh, is um, really getting to make, meet some great folks that you may not have other, my, otherwise met. There's a lot of the uh, youth programs um, where you see your future uh, and your city right in front of you. And, and uh, so it's always uh, a great opportunity to engage with the community. Uh, from time to time, we have uh, our appointments. Uh, we'll s sometimes be, uh, be unable to continue. And so uh, that, case, that was the case with the Community Services Advisory Committee appointment that I had previously. So um, we went out and uh, published a notice uh, for those folks who may be interested. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone who expressed interest and sent in a letter of uh, interest. Uh, but my appointment recommendation for the council is uh, Carmen Cortinas, who I've had the pleasure of working with for 10 years and who's, a, quite frankly, an asset to the high desert community and is well known through all of her uh, uh, service to the community in high desert th from Barstow to here and, and throughout the county. Um, and that is evidenced by a lot of the great relationships she's built with uh, even our, some of our own public safety folks. Uh, Captain Sam, Captain Schuler, um, uh, Chief Dan, um, um, uh, Chief Mejia. So, um, you know, it's a, it's it's a honor for me to make this appointment, and I ask the support of the council uh, to approve Miss Cortinas for the Community Services Advisory Committee. I second Mr. Negretti's motion to appoint Carmen Cortinas. I second it. I'm very honored and pleased to. Thank you. Motion by Mr. Negretti, second by Mr. Cox. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? So before there's a, a formal vote, I would like to give commentary. I wasn't given the opportunity once again. Please so go ahead. I will go ahead and comment now. So is Carmen in the audience right now by any chance? Do, does anyone know if she was able to make it here? Oh, hi. 
it's always nice to be able to see someone's face and you know we see things on paper when we hire people we also make sure we say hi how are you and I'd like to ask you a very brief question in order for me to be able to submit you have a very impressive resume and I appreciate the fact that Mr. Negretti said you work very closely for 10 years which is fabulous that really starts to show a character. Um, my only question to you was, um, what was the interest that drew you to engage at this level with a committee? I don't believe we are supposed to be asking questions to the public. Uh, this is an I'd like to follow item. the rules of the council meeting. So if you wanted to ask questions, I would suggest get with staff and then ask those questions so thank you we yeah, appreciate as, that as count as council members we have the opportunity to ask questions just as we do as staff and staff usually comes up very graciously and is able to do this it's very unfortunate that the response that i received really just dropped down to what I thought I, I had perceived was a very charismatic individual. I I'm sorry, I have you? five minutes according to the policy to be able to do that. If you would like to direct your comments, Mayor, to the attorney and start counting my time, I would appreciate you do that, but I have five minutes. Thank you. So like I was saying, as I thought that we were moving forward, so I'm sorry, Council Member Negretti, I won't be supporting um, this particular individual just because of what just happened. And so I, I felt very disrespected just trying to ask very simply. There was no need to do anything of that nature. And for the mayor, I appreciate that you allowed me my five minutes and thank you very much. If you call out for the vote, I'm ready to vote. You still have two and a half minutes if you wanna continue. Thank you, I appreciate that. This is the kind of leadership that we need to get rid of. And this is not a part of the, the MIDI, so I appreciate if um, the clerk would call the question. Uh, there has been a motion and a second, and I believe there are three yes votes. I, uh, it's just your vote that we have not recorded, Ms. Gomez. No. Okay, the motion Option carries no. with Ms. And Gomez. And please reflect why it was a no. Very disrespectful. Thank you. All right, so we. Yes, the vote's recorded. Okay. Uh, we move on to item D16. Uh, 15. 15. D15. Oh, co correct. Item D15. Award of contract to Cutting Edge Concrete Services, Inc. Uh, Madam Clerk, please read the recommendation. The recommendation is that the City Council award a contract to Cutting Edge Concrete Services, Inc. in the amount of $31,500 for the Santa Fe Wash Manhole Erosion Control Project. Questions? If there are no comments, will the Council move approval? Second. Motion by Mr. Cox, second by Ms. Gomez. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? None opposed, motion carries with Council Member Kennedy absent. Now we move on to item D16. Reject bid, bid submittals for 7th Street Median Desert Landscape Upgrade under project. Uh, Madam Clerk, read the recommendation. Oh, I'm sorry. Re go ahead, read the recommendation and I do have a card. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the rejection of the seven bid submittals for the 7th Street Median Desert Landscape Upgrade Project CC 18-005 and authorize staff to rebid the project. Thank you. I do have one card. Uh, Yoshi Yanis. What is it? Oh. Good, evening, good evening, Mayor, and Council Members, and everybody else present. My name is Yoshi Yanis. I'm here on behalf of Inland Empire Landscape in regards to the 7th Street Median Project, Project CC18-005. Um, the sheets I provided you with um, are the bids received by the city, and as we can see, the companies did a great job uh, in bidding in this project. The lowest four bidders all, were all within 8% of each other, which is minimal for a project over a million dollars. 
Uh, I know there's a document stating that the lowest bidder was 43.75 higher than the projected bio budget allowance. However, the bid was submitted in a way where the total bid base could be lowered. I figured this might have been done intentionally just in case the bid was over budget. The city requested deductive alternatives which have not been deducted from the total base bid, which is why the percentage is so high. If the deduction alternatives are taken into account, the total project amount would be within 12% of the total bu budget allowance. If a rebid is approved, the total project might actually increase. Now, a modified design would have to take place with more planning from the city, architects, design consultants, which will, at the end of the day, cost more time and money. In the end of the day, the project is rebidded. It might even be more expensive than the price with the deductions. The deductions I'm referring to are the deductions, deductions on the bid that we submitted, which is just 12% out of the budget allowance. The project amount was much lower. The project, the project that was estimated was much uh, lower, and as we can see, the bid result reflected that it was actually a competitive bid. It was just that the projection was a little bit off. Having a new, sign, uh, a new design and, and, and working with the design consultants aren't actually guaranteed that the project will be within a certain budget allowance, given that the, this has already had some setbacks already. Um, the city should reconsider the, reject, uh, should reconsider the rejection of these bid packages and take a look at the deductive alternatives included in the bid packages provided in order to make a decision. It is important to do so to maximize the efficiency of the city resources and the staff the money spent on this project would be best reflected on the field, in other words, the medians itself, instead of replanning, redesigning, and other necessary expenses for rebidding this project. It would be better to invest, this, uh, to invest the extra 12% on the actual field work that could be appreciated by the residents and can be an expense residents can acknowledge as a city putting in the maximum tax money in the most efficient way at work which can only be appreciated on the field and not by rebidding this project. Again, I ask you to take a second look at the deductive alternatives and please reconsider not providing a rejection for these bid packages. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor and members of the council, if I might, uh, just to address uh, the speaker's comments uh, so that you're aware, the item does uh, recommend. <coughs> document, you gave it to me. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, the, this item is a recommendation to reject uh, all bids and uh, basically rebid the project. Um, and the staff report speaks to, for the purpose of just creating an apples to apples comparison, it does show a 43.75% um, uh, result uh, above what we budgeted. So the bids came in substantially higher than what we uh, had budgeted. And that was on the totality of the project. We very, um, uh, we thought we, when we first bid the project, there may be issues with respect to having a finite budget and the potential for bids to come back higher than budget. So we very, um, we do this regularly in, in projects. We will create a, a deductive bidding to where you actually start. Um, you, you ask the bidders to, to bid certain elements that aggregate into the total project so that you can actually start deducting components that fit uh, so as to uh, try to fit it into your budget. Um, even taking that approach and looking at the deductives, uh, just simply put, uh, there aren't sufficient funds to build what we uh, believe is consistent with uh, the quality and integrity of the plans that you'd previously approved. So right now the only option, uh, we don't believe necessarily that we can do enough deductives and, and build a quality project, the only option really for us is to go back with the design firm and look at materials and look at uh, perhaps scaling back some of the scope uh, to come up with a project that still looks good, uh, has high quality, and that we can actually afford. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Don't have any other cards. I have a question, Madam Mayor. Staff has looked at the bids and they've made the determination that's contained in the agenda item. Does staff need any additional time to reconsider or look at these figures again? 
Uh, there is not a need for additional time. Staff has reviewed these. Staff does agree that they were very competitively bid. Uh, it just so happens that uh, the bid was substantially greater than what our project estimates were when we when we started. Thank you. Um, I move that we uh, reject the bid submittal for the Seventh Street Median Desert Landscape <coughs> Upgrade System. And uh, do you need a part of that bid to rebid it, or is that contained in the uh, recommendation? The staff recommendation does include that. If you wanted to just uh, simply move the staff recommendation, then, and then authorize staff to rebid. <coughs> Second. Motion by Mr. Cox, second by Mr. Negretti. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None opposed. Motion carries with Council Member Kennedy absent. Now we move on to uh, public comments. And I do have some cards. Uh, Madam Clerk, please uh, read the uh, statement. This is the time and place for the general public to address the City Council on any item listed or not listed on the agenda. Per Government Code Section 54954.3, State law prohibits the council from addressing any issue not previously included on the agenda. The council may receive testimony and set the matter to a subsequent meeting. Comments are to be limited to three minutes per individual or less as deemed necessary by the mayor, depending upon the number of individuals desiring to speak. All communications are to be addressed directly to the council, not the members of the audience. This is a professional business meeting and courtesy and decorum are expected. Please refrain from any debate between audience and speaker, making loud noises or engaging in any activity which might be disruptive to the decorum of the meeting. Any person or group who interferes with the conduct of a city council meeting by willfully interrupting and or disrupting the meeting is subject to removal. A peace officer may be requested to assist with the removal should any person or group fail to comply with an order of removal by the council. Any person or group who resists removal by a peace officer is subject to arrest and prosecution pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957.9 and Penal, Penal Code Section 403. Thank you. Uh, the first card that I have is uh, Rossini Risi, and then after uh, Ros Rossini will be Ed Sutherland. Good evening, Council. Um, my name is Racine Reese, and I am the founder of Women of Noble Character, which is a nonprofit um, project of the High Desert Community Foundation here in Victorville. Um, we have two programs, one of them being our Show Your Hearts, Not Your Body Parts conference that we do for teen girls, and the other is our Meal a Day Coalition, which consists of seven groups and over 30 volunteers. And I am here with some of the members of our coalition uh, tonight with the concern that we have that's recently arisen. For the last six and a half years, we have been serving meals um, near, 7th and La pa near the 7th and La Paz area. And for the last two plus years, we have been serving dinner out of the Salvation Army Church five to seven days a week. In March, we were listed with the USDA as a congregate meal site and have been serving, um, well, over 700 meals a month since then, topping out at over 900 meals in September. About two months ago, our meal service was suspended pending approval and clearance of the Salvation Ar Army Legal Department, and we're now being told that we may be able to resume come the new year, but nothing is certain. <coughs> our concern is that there is a serious need in the area that is no longer being addressed, considering that we not only serve the homeless, but anyone that comes in for a meal, including children. The need becomes very obvious toward the end of the month when our numbers double as people run out of food, stamps, and food before the month is over. We are looking into other options to see if there is another kitchen in the area that can accommodate us in the meantime, but our ultimate goal is to obtain our own um, kitchen so that we can continue to address the need in that area. Uh, I have my colleague will also be coming up to speak more on the statistical side of that, but we wanted to come before the city council to make you aware of what we have been doing, um, what's going on, and the need that we are still trying to continue to address. 
in the area. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. Ed Sutherland. After Ed will be Richard uh, Gomez. Good evening, and uh, thank you for having me speak to all the council, mayor, um, and all the uh, uh, assistant city managers and deputy city managers and uh, clerks. Thank you. My name is Ed Sutherland. I was a veteran of the United States Air Force, honorably discharged. I was homeless. I'm now a homeowner, a taxpayer, and a member of Sunrise Church in Victorville. And I'm also a member of the Faith 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 Group, Women of Noble Character, who serve uh, a number uh, of meals to homeless and to poor, needy people, including children, monthly. Throughout history, faith-based organizations have led efforts to alleviate homelessness and hunger, now providing support to more than 565,000 individuals on the streets. Despite their tireless work, there has been little effort to both qualify and quantify the measurable difference they make in individual lives and for society as a whole. This is why the Baylor Institute conducted a city survey study released earlier this year. What was found was innate value on par with and in many cases unmatched by municipalities, federal and state government, and non-faith community groups. Faith-based organizations supplied nearly 60% of emergency shelter beds surveyed. What was also apparent was the nature of support faith-based organizations delivered. Most importantly, implementation in, of initiatives to help homeless and the poor chart paths towards both addressing progress and stability. The faith-based initiative provides help by addressing homelessness as a pattern and implementing long-term solutions. Because of this, faith-based faith -based organizations are able to reduce the burden on society's most important institutions, healthcare, family services, public assistance programs, and law enforcement. It was noted that faith-based organizations helping individuals get back on their feet translated into $8.27 in taxpayer savings for every $1 in government funding. That's an estimated $119 million in taxpayer savings. Um, in closing, I just want to say what I'm trying to say is, is that faith-based organizations, if you work with us, we're here and we're willing and we can do the job, just like Jesus had five loaves and two small fish, and he fed 5,000 people. We can do the same if we have your support. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Gomez, after Richard Gomez, Dominic Molina. Mr. Gomez left the meeting, I believe. Dominic Molina. Good evening, Mayor Garcia and City Council members. My name is Dominic Molina, and I'm here on behalf of Root, Revive Our Old Town, and Family Assistance Program, also known as the Fan Spot. The Fan Spot has a small office on 7th Street and have recently been blessed with another bigger building on the corner of C Street and 6th Street, across, across the street from the old Rancho Theater. Well, I'm here tonight to invite you all to the Family Assistance Program Grand Opening and Ribbon Cutting Ceremony on Thursday, December 14th from 2 to 5 p.m. Located 
at 16857 C Street in Old Town, Victorville. The mayor has graciously agreed to be guest speaker, but we would also like to invite everyone of you also. Please come and spend an evening with your community, Santa, and have a cup of hot cocoa. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Uh, Maggie Martin. Good evening again. Can you hear me? Because I'm congested. Okay, now I can hear me. Um, Your Honor and Council, um, I noticed maybe a couple minutes after I came into the meeting that um, Shay Johnson and Susan Mahoney from the Daily Press are here. Um, I'm glad because I probably need to talk to them after the meeting and it's not normal or customary for me to air the dirty laundry, which is right there, to the press. But I, I have a cell phone at home and I'm one of the archaic people that actually still have a landline and I will always have a landline, period. So I'm not glued to my phone. It just so happens I picked it up around three o'clock and there was an email that alarmed me and I responded to it and found out that Ms. Gomez was distressed by an email that I had sent her and she had contacted the Victorville PD regarding that. Now, that said, that's all I'm gonna say in this public forum, but it's gonna be on blast about the whole deal. I will be sharing my thoughts, feelings, opinions, and emails that I've tried to keep right here in house and not air the dirty laundry. But really, because you violated a strong boundary with me. Strong boundary. So unnecessary. We're not 12. You got a problem with me? Call me, email me, we can talk. But I will tell you this. The only place I would ever talk to you, number one, is right here in these chambers and only with a witness. That's the only way I would ever talk to you. So don't ever even think about saying a word to me outside of these chambers. You haven't yet. Thank you for having at least that much common sense. So I'm going to make myself available to the daily press if they would like to interview me and I will give them a rundown of Blanca Gomez and the city council meetings and her behavior and her antics and her rude, disrespectful behavior. I will break it down for them in detail with pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ryan McEachern. Past mayor. <laughs> uh, mayor, member. members of the city council. That it's good to be, uh, <laughs> yes, it's good to be back here before you. Um, actually, it's been a year. Um, I was actually uh, reminded when I left the dais that uh, I couldn't actually uh, lobby or be before you advocating for anything for a period of one year. Well, it's been one year. Um, <laughs> but I'm not here to advocate anything tonight. I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, uh, Mayor Garcia, you've done a wonderful job. I know it's not an easy position to be in that chair. I've been there. I was there for two years. Um, I know you changed the policies this last year but I'm glad to see that the uh, council uh, kept you in that position. I think you're doing a good job and keep up the good work. And, so and of course, with Mayor Pro Tem Cox at your side, I know that you will. I will and, never uh, go wrong uh, with him next to Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate all the work he's done as well. Um, I, I'm, so, I'm here somewhat also to uh, say a few goodbyes because, uh, Doug, I, I, I hate to see you go, um, but I, I know you're... Uh, not going far away, and um, and you're still a friend for the city of Victorville, and I'm I'm glad to see you're moving over to Apple Valley, uh, Mr. Metzler. I see that the council has uh, found good faith in you to have you move into that role uh, after Doug leaves us. But um, Doug, it's been a pleasure working with you over the years, and 
I, I know that you still have a lot of good things to do for the, the Victor Valley and specifically as you move over to Apple Valley. Um, Carol Lee, <laughs> I don't want to cry, but, uh, <laughs> but you are leaving us too. And um, I just wanted to make sure that publicly I, I had a chance to say goodbye to you. I know you're going to have a little bit of a party uh, uh, going away, <laughs> and I plan on being there. But uh, um, boy, did you keep me on track when I was in that seat. And, uh, and I'm sure you're going to be sorely missed it here as well. So um, last thing I want to say is, boy, how things change and how things stay the same. You all argued up here over $1,500. Can you believe it? $1,500. And in the previous five items, you spent over $8 million. Um, I remember when I sat up there and people would say that to me, and I thought it was so stupid to hear that. But in reality, when you sit out here, you all need to take a look at what you're doing because... $1,500 to put someone on a committee to try to actually do something good, and you're arguing over that versus the $8 million you spent previous to that. So uh, keep that in mind. I'm no longer forbidden, according to the city attorney. He can answer that for you from speaking to you or advocating on anything with respect to the city of Victorville, so you will see me again. Good night. I sure hope so. Thank you, Brian. That was the last card that I had. Um, is there anyone else that would like to speak? I don't see anyone. Uh, so we will have reports from city manager. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think it's been 367 days since Ryan left, so <laughs> we got two free days, I guess. Um, so a uh, couple of past events had a very successful parade uh, put on by Kiwanis, but we helped them out quite a bit with that. So I want to thank Kiwanis uh, for stepping up uh, when the chamber was looking to, to not do that anymore. So we really appreciate them uh, stepping forward and, and taking that on and doing a great job. We're happy to help them each year. Um, our tree lighting ceremony, uh, same day this past Saturday, was a lot of fun. Uh, I want to thank the High Desert Harmonaires, High Country Harmonaires, I think actually is their name. Uh, and Excelsior Extreme Choir. My daughter happens to be in that choir. I thought she sounded great. The rest of them were pretty good too. Um, the uh, I want to thank staff. Um, you know, we had somebody uh, take an opportunity in another city um, not long ago, and a new staff member uh, stepped up and stepped into that role. And we had a fabulous uh, interactive musical light show, uh, like has grown, and it was exciting to see that that continue. I think there was some of us that were a little bit concerned when Dave left us that, oh my gosh, who's going to do that? And, uh, and um, I'm sorry her name escapes me, but um, I'll thank her personally uh, later on this week. So, um, of course, I want to thank Santa and Mrs. Claus for, for showing up and, and doing what they do. Um, we had about a thousand people in attendance this year. Uh, it's bigger than last year. Um, it was uh, relatively pleasant weather, which was kind of nice. Sometimes it can get windy and downright cold. Uh, so other things happening, uh, the library is currently uh, on a brief closure for renovations, getting new carpet and paint, uh, and it will be reopening, uh, scheduled to reopen on December 18th, uh, Monday, and here that was uh, paid for out of community development block grants. Uh, and then uh, finally, the only other thing I'll mention uh, is our rec pages are going into mailboxes uh, this week, so keep an eye out for your uh, winter, spring uh, programs, uh, all the great things, all the great offerings from January through May, um, as well as uh, news. We've added a few pages on the front end for some city news in there, so keep an eye out for those things. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Blanca Gomez. So, did we skip the agenda items, or are we just going straight to the comments? We're do on we item. We're on item E3, discussion and possible action regarding items for upcoming city council agenda. Okay. So, yes, I have a couple. Um, I'd like to be able to discuss community partnerships with nonprofit organizations, stakeholders, and community at large and start asking city councils to support these types of discussions. We've had several groups and organizations in the past couple of months voice these concerns. And um, I'm an advocate for the community in this regard, and I'm asking the city council to at least have a discussion 
and show the community that we're all ears and we're here to represent them. They take the time out of their busy schedules to come up and voice these concerns. A lot of the times these chambers have been very, very empty. So lately they've gotten full and I'm glad that the community is starting to know that we have a representation that's willing to at least voice their concerns. So I'm asking the support of the council to have this at least an agenda item. Who are you talking about? Have what on the agenda item? Yes, uh, to, I'm asking to have community partnerships with nonprofit organizations, stakeholders, and communities at large, and the council to support this, and we will be discussing this in the agenda. I asked the council to reject that. Who? We have hundreds of nonprofits. We have a partnership with everyone. We, every <coughs> spring, we give out monies to nonprofits. We have a particular individual who seemingly worked for and against Measure K who now wants to form a committee and be the advocate of a 15-point plan and the author of it, and everything that's in it, this council has already done. So beside plagiarizing what the city council has already done on behalf of the community, he now wants to address the council and give us the benefit of his experience in law enforcement when he has none. I'm not interested in listening to him. The council can if they want. But if you're interested in meeting with him, go meet with him. I'm uh, sorry, um, <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Cox. Um, I, it wasn't implicit, and I didn't refer to this individual or this nonprofit, so I'll be a little bit more specific. We actually have a group up here that just spoke right in front of us um, dealing with the women's. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I wrote your information down, but this particular um, organization wanted the support of council, and I made myself available and said I would put it on the agenda with the support of at least two other council members to be able to hear what it is that we can partner in and so that, this is the reason why I'm bringing this to the agenda right now. And it, it may be a great idea if I knew what they were advocating, but to open it up and say, we're going to partnership and invite groups to come and talk to us about things that we don't know about. We don't know what the request is. We don't know what they're involved in. We don't know if they're a legal nonprofit or if they've just declared a nonprofit. If we have the information, I suppose, I'm betting that I and the rest of the council would endorse it, but just to open it up blind to come and be lobbied on items we have no idea what they want to discuss, I can't support that. Well, it's been in the past, uh, Mayor Pro Temp, where we had put stuff on the agenda and the other four council members don't have to go in much of depth. It's just a second and then a motion and then it goes through. But it's uh, very unfortunately that I have to continue to explain and advocate on someone else's behalf. This is not my own project. I want to assist the community to let them know that we're all ears for them. These are our voters. These are the people we represent. These are community members. And I, all I wanted to voice is their concern at this level. I have the honor of being able to sit and be one voice at many times a very thankless job. But nonetheless, I focus on the individuals that want a voice here, and I voice it for them. But if that's not an agenda item, there is no issue. I guess I will continue on. I have a second one. The second thing, I had another veteran come up, and he told all of us, and hopefully he convinced the majority of us to put a uh, discussion of what he would like to talk about in veterans the first meeting of January. That was his voice, not mine, and I'm just advocating for what this gentleman came up, and that's another thing that I would also seek support in b on behalf of Mr. Gomez. So with that, I call, is there a second motion? There is no second to that motion, then the motion dies. Thank you. Okay. And that was, there is no further um, things that I wanted to add on the agenda. Just for information's sake for the council, uh, the first meeting in January uh, historically has been canceled because it occurs literally the day after staff returns from uh, the holiday season. So uh, this year, uh, the, typically the first Monday, uh, it, well, not typically, it is on January 2nd. So although it, the meeting hasn't been formally canceled uh, because we don't have any staff here to prepare an agenda, uh, I would imagine that would be uh, canceled. Um, as part of this item, if I can maybe ask the city attorney, uh, I don't think I'm violating anything here, but if so, we'll, dis we'll handle it another way. But uh, the next meeting in December is on the 19th of December. Sometimes we cancel that meeting as well, uh, but that's usually when it's a little closer to Christmas. So um, I, we 
in some years have had a problem uh, gaining a quorum for that meeting. So uh, if it's appropriate for the council to give us some input as to whether or not they're available on that day and whether or not uh, they would like us to look at canceling it or not, it would be helpful. Yeah. That's not on the agenda this evening, so I would suggest you poll the council members on that okay. outside of the meeting. Um, is it my turn? Okay. Yeah, I, I listened very carefully to the individual um, regarding the veterans. We do see placards with individuals holding them saying homeless veteran according to the county. They, they, don't, they don't exist uh, because the county had a major program, spent a lot of money. They contacted every individual who claimed they were a veteran and they took an action and Mr. Lovingood reported that they had handled those cases and so the people claiming to be homeless veterans and, and holding the placard turned out not to be veterans. In regard to the request to listen to the groups, the individual, um, I'd, I'd like to have the staff report, uh, do we still have a problem with veterans or not, are people claiming to be veterans because it's easier to get uh, people to give them money. Uh, he mentioned AMVETS, I'm a life member of AMVET. He mentioned American Legion, I'm a member of the American Legion. I know how involved we are in the Elks Club with our veterans program. And we work very closely with the veterans program. I'm not sure what the city uh, can do to help because there's a large, uh, uh, large number of people who are involved. However, based upon what's going on in the world, if we can find ourselves in a position to help the veterans, I agree. I agree with Ms. Gomez that we need to put that on the agenda, let them talk about it, but I would ask the city staff to research to find out do we have a brand new group of homeless veterans because I'm told we do not. It's other reasons they need help, but not because of homelessness, but we need to know from the council member's point of view. The only other thing that I have, and I'm not sure how to handle it, we had a discussion at last meeting where I requested that we put an item on the council agenda for discussion in relationship to the master plan of streets that shows Green Tree Boulevard to be six lanes rather than the four lanes, and I don't believe it can ever be six lanes, but I thought the council should discuss it. It was a 5-0 vote, and it's not on the agenda. Mr. City Attorney, can we discuss this in executive session at our next meeting? Because it does involve personnel. Uh, you certainly can put that on the agenda. Well, then I would make a motion to add this uh, previous. I, I'm just. I'm hoping that we're just busy as staff. I'm not going to blame them. Excuse well, me, Mayor Pro Tem is still agenda. speaking. It's okay. Is there a motion, During Mr. Yes, Mr. I Cox? I no, is there a motion, Mr. Cox, to add that to the agenda? Is that I, that was the request? If based on the legal opinion, can we discuss it in executive session? You can discuss personnel issues in in closed session. Yes. Then I would make a request that if the council agree that we put this on the next agenda to be discussed. That's my motion. I second it. Motion by Mr. Cox, second by Ms. Garcia. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Do I have a question in regards to this? Does this mean we're going to be using a closed session agendized item to discuss personnel behaviors or misconduct of some sort because but you had to your me, turn I'm sorry, to I have speak. a question in you regards had your turn to speak. and you didn't allow me to give the comment. Ready so now. I wanted turn. to sh make sure that is that what the motion is? What does this mean? The motion is to add a personnel matter item to the next closed session and that I believe received at least three affirmative votes. That's it. Uh, in order to add that item I'm curious what position uh, is going to be discussed. If it's mine I do have a comment. I, I think that uh, I simply want to know from discussion with council when we take an action of 5 0 to direct staff to do something, do they have the option of ignoring the council? I don't think they do, but we may need another policy, but it's a personal action. I'm not making any accusations. In order to not embarrass anyone, I'd like to have a discussion first in executive session. I, I still have a question of the attorney, actually. Typically, with a personnel action, the position is required to be listed? Yes, it would have to be listed as to what the title of the position is. In order for the city clerk to do her job, I'm just requesting 
The title of the position to be listed on the agenda. Okay. I need clarification to what is this title? That would be my question. I've known that these are strategies to intimidate staff personnel, and, and I don't agree if this is something that's happening, because I think I can move to add an agenda item to make it specifically what Mr. Cox has said. I mean, we all make mistakes, so I don't understand why this has to go in that regard. I see a negative uh, point to this, and I don't want to take it to that level. We've had it enough, and I don't think it needs to be another pattern, and I've learned that really quickly. So I don't know what's going on, who's going to be there, what are we discussing, what action, what was the behavior that we're going to chastise if that's the case or mis am I misinterpreting it? That would be it? the purpose of the discussion in the closed session. So what's the title of the person? You have to be able to disclose. I, sus I suspect that the, make the motion maker will provide that to the city clerk. I'm sorry, what did you say? Or it's put on the agenda. Somebody's going to designate who, what the title is. So why can't we do it in open session as we're having that discussion now? It's not my motion. So it looks like the motion was a vote. All four of them voted yes. Is that, that the case? Because I'm not getting any responses. The audience probably won't get any. So I'm voting no. And I for I'm the reasons, because we don't have a title for it. I'm asking for the excuse uh, of why it's showing it, a no. So please yeah. have that at the minutes to show why I voted no on this action. So now we move on to our reports from council members. Madam Mayor, if I may go first. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see uh, former council members, mayor, uh, in the chambers. Um, you've uh, certainly been through your share, um, not just here, but uh, also on the planning commission. And uh, service obviously is not for everyone. Uh, so you, uh, you've definitely uh, been a great part of this, uh, <clears throat> this city. So look forward to speaking with you again soon. Uh, as far as some of the other uh, nonprofits uh, and the other organizations uh, that have presented um, their case today and told us uh, what they are what they're doing, I think you're in the right place. Um, you can I'll give you my card and you can we'll email or uh, set up an appointment. Uh, but there's a process and we can't really engage uh, with folks if it's not on the agenda. Uh, so usually by the time the uh, reports from council members comes around at the end people have left uh, but that doesn't mean we're not hearing you um, I heard you I think there's a lot of great opportunities a lot of existing programs out there uh, if you're not aware of them or the processes for example the uh, CDBG program community development block grant program is is uh, something I really enjoy doing with the mayor every every uh, year um, mayor pro tem Cox mentioned that so you're in the right place uh, we've had a lot of issues come up through this way, and uh, at first it's kind of hard to to action anything when it's the first time you've heard about it. So, But there is a process. There are great relationships out there. The High Desert Homeless Shelter has started the Warming Center. Um, those folks have a lot of tremendous uh, relationships as well, and, and that's really all it is. It's just building that relationship and... Uh, you know, we all start somewhere, and uh, there's, there's. Uh, I can speak later uh, offline, but um, so that's that's really what it is. It's just there's a process, and we have folks that have been at it for a while, and they're very effective, and that's really what we're after is effective community partnerships. We have a lot of great leadership in this room, uh, and that's what it takes to run a city, actually, because uh, we can't do it all by ourselves. So um, there are things that I think we can talk about offline, but I just wanted to say thank you for coming, and... Uh, Switching over to uh, the folks that are departing and the new folks that are coming in. Uh, congratulations to the folks coming in and uh, best wishes and continued success uh, to the folks um, departing the city, of course. Uh, you, you, again, it goes the same thing with the city clerk and the city manager. You've just been a tremendous part of this city and uh, just because you go across the freeway doesn't mean uh, re relationships die. As a matter of fact, I'm counting on those types of uh, changes to help strengthen the desert overall because uh, it's much easier to work with people when you have a relationship obviously last thing uh thank you mayor mayor pro tem and everybody else that participated in the uh christmas parade it was a fantastic experience and those organizations that all participated really made a difference to a lot of those kids out there uh, when you when you signify that the start of the christmas season by a tree lighting and a parade um, you can't help it, even though I was resisting the Christmas music. I'm all in, so uh, I was very excited. Thank you to Victorville Motors for the uh, transportation for the council members. 
And, um, you know, I just wanted to say a couple of things before people break for the holidays. So thank you. Thank you. Um, are we at the report from <coughs> council members? Is that okay? Um, congratulations uh, to the mayor uh, for being uh, elected by the council to one year term. Uh, happy holidays to everyone and uh, to Ms. Gomez for your kind words during that process of electing mayor and mayor pro tem. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I uh, hope everyone has safe and happy holidays. Did you have something? Yes. So I truly feel for the young man who came prepared, received a terse and curse response. Please let me assure you that not all of us as elected will always respond in a cold matter or deliver our responses. Indeed, first impressions do carve long-lasting impressions. There has also been a history uh, of attacks in his, there has been an attack in history from John F. Kennedy to Gabrielle Gifford, if you guys are not familiar. Uh, when someone says your days are numbered and profanely laced, consistently riddled in my email inboxes, I'm sorry to find that to be threatening, not only to my personhood, but to my life, to the immediacy of my beloved ones. And I will continue to document, to document these instances and these emails to show patterns of misbehavior. So if anything were to happen, it will always be documented. Uh, all the same time, I will apologize on behalf of the city to the misguided leadership that it, I'm sorry, but if the mayor would like to quiet down what's happening over here on the side, I will apologize on behalf of the city to the misguided leadership that is being presented and you are witnessing right now as I speak. It's very disrespectful to have someone in the chamber room tonight and see how this meeting has been drawn out. Um, also, the appointments to the committee, to the committee, I remember seeing Liliana Collins. She hasn't been at the ICH meetings. Is there a reason why she's not a participant in the ICH meetings? There's a soon approximating date of January 25th. There's the homeless count, and I would like to see our representatives from the city continue to attend these meetings if they haven't. I've been to those meetings at least three times, and I haven't seen the representation, but I did see her on the 10-year plan, so hopefully we can get people on board. I'd also like to say thank you to the, commu the community that consistently shows up in person and watches the live broadcast. You will begin to see the alignments as you follow the city council meetings. These seats are not permanent. The community of Victorville voters speaks louder in any time that there is a vote and volumes are more than those naysayers that you may find across. For the record, it is my understanding that agendizing items are for communication. So if a council member asks to speak and it's an agendized item, we can go ahead and do that. As you heard Mr. Negretti said, say, if there is something that is not agendized, the Brown Act does not allow for that communication to happen. And lastly, a call to those who want to run for office is very essential. I'm here as a resource. Please reach out to me if you're interested. We will be hosting future trainings, and I'm available, even if you're watching broadcast or you're here. Thank you. Spread the word. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Okay, I guess it's my turn now. All I want to say is that this year, 2017, we had the best Veterans Parade uh, we had the best per, uh, Christmas parade. Uh, the uh, Christmas tree lighting was attended by more people than we had before. Uh, so I do believe that things are improving even though we still have the homeless issue and uh, other issues here at the dais. But uh, overall, I feel very proud of my city and I thank all the uh, people from the city of Victorville and the surrounding communities. Um, I'm not afraid of the voters. Uh, there's a video out there somewhere that uh, Ms. Gomez stated that we were afraid of the voters. I don't know what that means, but I'm not afraid of you people. I mean, you're the ones that voted me here. So anyhow, outside of that, um, I hate to see Carolee leave. Uh, she is the greatest person in the world. I don't think, um, well, I shouldn't say nobody can be as efficient as she is because I'm pretty sure that the next person that comes along after 31 years will be as efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> but I will miss you dearly, and uh, you have been a great friend and always there 
ready to assist and explain and I'll miss you too. Uh, I have learned to really love you. It was great. And then again, our city manager. Um, I'm sorry that you're leaving us, but um, that's the way life is. We move on, right? So um, I've done it in my lifetime. I had uh, some beautiful opportunities to uh, before being in business for myself to work for some beautiful people and uh, and I moved on so to greater things and we all do that and there's a few of us that can do that and there's some that uh, when they leave they leave in bad terms and they can <coughs> never come back and I'm happy to say that all the people that I have been uh, in business with or work for them and uh, we're still friends. And, and um, I just want to say that I will miss you. And outside of that, I wish everyone a Merry Christmas, even though I believe we still have another meeting. Uh, but nevertheless, I just want everyone to know that um, I don't go around passing out my card because I don't have to. You know who I am. You know you can contact me. Um, if there's anything that I can do for you, please feel free um, to call the city, make an appointment. I'll be there for you. I can meet with you. And um, outside of that, uh, Merry Christmas and a very happy new year. And thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned. You too. All right, see ya.